Section 21 of Diaries Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Venice. The arsenal is thought to be one of the best furnished in the world. We entered by a strong port, always guarded, and descending a spacious gallery saw arms of back, breast and head for many thousands. In another were saddles, over them ensigns taken from the Turks. Another hall is for the meeting of the Senate. Passing a graph are the Smith's forges, where they are continually employed on anchors and ironwork. Near it is a well of fresh water, which they impute to two rhinoceroses' horns, which they say lie in it, and will preserve it from ever being empoisoned. Then we came to where the carpenters were building their magazines of oars, masts, etc., for an hundred galleys and ships, which have all their apparel and furniture near them. Then the foundry, where they cast ordnance. The forge is 450 paces long, and one of them has 13 furnaces. There is one cannon weighing 16,573 pounds, cast while Henry III died and put into a galley, built, rigged and fitted, for launching within that time. They have also arms for twelve galleasses, which are vessels to row of almost 150 feet long and 30 wide, not counting prow or poop, and contain 28 banks of oars, each seven men, and to carry 1,300 men with three masts. In another, a magazine for fifty galleys, and place for some hundreds more. Here stands the Bucentaur, with the most ample deck, and so contrived that the slaves are not seen, having on the poop a throne for the doge to sit, where he goes in triumph to espouse the Adriatic. Here is also a galley of two hundred yards long for cables, and above that a magazine of hemp. Opposite these are the saltpetre houses, and a large row of cells or houses to protect their galleys from the weather. Over the gate, as we go out, is a room full of great and small guns, some of which discharge six times at once. Then there is a court full of cannon, bullets, chains, grapples, granados, etc., and over that arms for 800,000 men and by themselves arms for four hundred, taken from some that were in a plot against the state, together with weapons of offence and defence for sixty-two ships, thirty-two pieces of ordnance, on carriages taken from the Turks, and one prodigious mortar-piece. In a word, it is not to be reckoned up what this large place contains of this sort. There were now twenty-three galleys and four galley grossi of a hundred oars to a side. The whole arsenal is walled about and may be encompassed about three miles with twelve towers for the watch, besides that the sea environs it. The workmen, who are ordinarily five hundred, march out in military order and every evening receive their pay through a small hole in the gate where the governor lives. The next day I saw a wretch executed who had murdered his master, for which he had his head chopped off by an axe that slid down a frame of timber between the two tall columns in St. Mark's piazza at the sea brink, the executioner striking on the axe with a beetle, and so the hell fed off the block. Hence by Gudala we went to see Grimani's palace, the portico whereof is excellent work, Indeed, the world cannot show a city of more stately buildings, considering the extent of it, all of square stone, and as chargeable in their foundations as superstructure, being all built on piles at an immense cost. We returned home by the church of St. Johanna and Paola, before which is, in copper, the statue of Bartolomeo Colonne, on horseback, double gilt, on a stately pedestal, the work of Andrea Verrocchio of Florentine. This is a very fine church, and has in it many rare altarpieces of the best masters, especially that on the left hand of the two friars slain, which is of Titian. The day after, being Sunday, I went over to St. George's to the ceremony of the schismatic Greeks, 
who are permitted to have their church, though they are at defiance with Rome. They allow no carved images, but many painted, especially the story of their patron and his dragon. Their rites differ not much from the Latins, save that of communicating in both species and distribution of the holy bread. We afterward fell into a dispute with the Candio concerning the procession of the Holy Ghost. The church is a noble fabric. The church of St. Zachary is a Greek building by Leo the Fourth Emperor and has in it the bones of that prophet with diverse other saints. Near this we visited St. Luke's, famous for the tomb of Aretin. Tuesday we visited several other churches as Santa Maria, newly encrusted with marble on the outside and adorned with porphyry, ophite and spartan stone. Near the altar and under the organ are sculptures that are said to be of the famous artist Praxiteles. To that of St Paul I went purposely to see the tomb of Titian, then to St John the Evangelist, where among other heroes lies Andrea Baldarius, the inventor of oars applied to great vessels for fighting. We also saw St Roche, the roof whereof is with the school or hall of that rich confraternity, admirably painted by Tintoretto, especially the crucifix in the Sacristia. We saw also the church of St Sebastian and Carmelite's monastery. Next day, taking our gondola at St Mark's, I passed to the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, where is a convent of Benedictines, and a well-built church of Andrea Palladio, the great architect. The pavement, cupola, choir and pictures, very rich and sumptuous. The cloister has a fine garden to it, which is a rare thing at Venice, though this is an island a little distant from the city. It has also an olive orchard, all environed by the sea. The new cloister now building has a noble staircase, paved with white and black marble. From hence we visited San Spirito and St Lawrence, fair churches in several islands, but most remarkable is that of the Padre Arivetani in St Helen's Island, for the rare paintings and carvings, with inlaid work, etc. Padua The next morning we went again to Padua, where on the following day we visited the market, which is plentifully furnished and exceedingly cheap. Here we saw the great hall, built in a spacious piazza, and one of the most magnificent in Europe. Its ascent is by steps, a good height, of a reddish marble polished, much used in these parts, and happily found not far off. It is almost two hundred paces long, and forty in breadth, all covered with lead, without any support of columns. At the further end stands the bust in white marble of Titus Livius, the historian. In this town is the house wherein he was born, full of inscriptions and pretty fair. Near to the monument of Speron Speroni is painted on the ceiling the celestial zodiac and other astronomical figures. With outside there is a corridor, in manner of a balcony of the same stone. At the entrance of each of the three gates is the head of some famous person, as Albert Erimitano, Giulio Paolo lawyers, and Peter Aponius. In the piazza is the Podestas and Capitano Grande's palace, well built, but above all the Monte Pieta, the front whereof is of most excellent architecture. This is a foundation of which there is one in most of the cities in Italy, where there is a continual bank of money to assist the poorer sort on any pawn and as reasonable interest together with magazines for deposit of goods till redeemed. Hence to the schools of this flourishing and ancient university, especially for the study of physic and anatomy. They are fairly built in quadrangle, with cloisters beneath and above with columns. Over the great gate are the arms of the Venetian state, and under the lion of St. Mark, sic ingridere ut type so quaditie doctior, Sic agridere ut indies patriae Christiane, republicae utiliori vadas, ita demum gymnasium ate feliciter se onatum existimabit. Sic nine. 
Above the court walls are carved in stone and painted the blazons of the consuls of all the nations that from time to time have had that charge and honour in the university, which at my being there was my worthy friend Dr. Rogers, who here took that degree. The schools for the lectures of the several sciences are above, but none of them comparable, or so much frequented, as a theatre for anatomy, which is excellently contrived both for the dissector and spectators. I was this day invited to dinner, and in the afternoon, 30th of July, received my matricula, being resolved to spend some time months here at study, especially physic and anatomy, of both which there were now the most famous professors in Europe. My matricula contained a clause that I, my goods, servants and messengers, should be free from all tolls and reprises, and that we might come, pass, return, buy or sell, without any toll, etc. The next morning I saw the garden of simples, rarely furnished with plants, and gave order to the gardener to make me a collection of them for an hortus hyamalis, by permission of the cavalier Dr. Veslingius, then prefect and botanic professor, as well as of anatomy. This morning the Earl of Arundel, now in this city, a famous collector of paintings and antiquities, invited me to go with him to see the garden of Mantua, where, as one enters, stands a huge coloss of Hercules. From hence to a place where was a room covered with a noble cupola, built purposely for music, the fillings up or cove between the walls were of urns and earthen pots for the better sounding. It was also well painted. After dinner we walked to the palace of Foscari alla Arena, there remaining yet some appearances of an ancient theatre, though serving now for a court only before the house. There were now kept in it two eagles, a crane, a Mauritian sheep, a stag, and sundry fowls, as in a vivary. Venice Three days after I returned to Venice and passed over to Murano, famous for the best glasses in the world, where having viewed their furnaces and seen their work, I made a collection of diverse curiosities and glasses, which I sent for England by long sea. It is the white flints they have from Pavia, which they pound and sift exceedingly small, and mix with ashes made of a seaweed brought out of Syria, and a white sand that causes this manufacture to excel. The town is a Podestaria by itself, at some miles distant on the sea from Venice, and like it, built on several small islands. In this place are excellent oysters, small and well tasted, like our Colchester, and they were the first, as I remember, that I ever could eat, for I had naturally an aversion to them. At our return to Venice we met several gondolas full of Venetian ladies who come thus far in fine weather to take the air with music and other refreshments. Besides that, Murano is itself a very nobly built town and has diverse noblemen's palaces in it and handsome gardens. In coming back we saw the islands of St Christopher and St Michael the last of which has a church enriched and encrusted with marbles and other architectonic ornaments, which the monks very courteously showed us. It was built and founded by Margaret Emiliana of Verona, a famous courtesan, who purchased a great estate, and by this foundation hoped to commute for her sins. We then rode by the Isles of St Nicholas, whose church, with the monuments of the Justinian family, entertained us a while, and then got home. The next morning Captain Powell, in whose ship I was to embark toward Turkey, invited me on board, lying about ten miles from Venice, where we had a dinner of English powdered beef and other good meat, with store of wine and great guns, as the manner is. After dinner, the captain presented me with a stone he had lately brought from Grand Cairo, which he took from the mummy pits, full of hieroglyphics. I drew it on paper with the true dimensions, and sent it in a letter to Mr. Henshaw, to communicate to Father Kircher, who was then setting forth his great work, Obeliscus Pamphilius, where it is described, 
but without mentioning my name. The stone was afterward brought for me into England and landed at Wapping, where before I could hear of it, it was broken into several fragments and utterly defaced, to my no small disappointment. The boatswain of the ship also gave me a hand and foot of a mummy, the nails whereof had been overlaid with thin plates of gold, and the whole body was perfect when he brought it out of Egypt. But the avarice of the ship's crew broke it to pieces and divided the body among them. He presented me also with two Egyptian idols and some loaves of the bread which the Coptics use in the Holy Sacrament with other curiosities. 8th August 1645 I had news from Padua of my election to be Syndicus Ardistarum, which caused me, after two days idling in a country villa with the consul of Venice, to hasten thither, that I might discharge myself of that honour, because it was not only chargeable, but would have hindered my progress, and they chose a Dutch gentleman in my place, which did not well please my countrymen, who had laboured not a little to do me the greatest honour a stranger is capable of in that university. Being freed from this impediment, and having taken leave of Dr. Janisius, a Polonian, who was going as physician in the Venetian galleys to Candia, I went again to Venice, and made a collection of several books and some toys. Three days after, I returned to Padua, where I studied hard till the arrival of Mr. Henshaw, Bramston, and some other English gentlemen, whom I had left at Rome, and who made me go back to Venice, where I spent some time in showing them what I had seen there. 26 September 1645 My dear friend, until now my constant fellow traveller, Mr. Thickness, being obliged to return to England upon his particular concern, and who had served His Majesty in the wars, I accompanied him part of his way, and on the 28th returned to Venice. 29th September 1645 Michaelmas Day I went with my Lord Mowbray, eldest son to the Earl of Arundel and a most worthy person, to see the collection of a noble Venetian, Signor Ruggini. He has a stately palace, richly furnished with statues and heads of Roman emperors, all placed in an ample room. In the next was a cabinet of medals, both Latin and Greek, with diverse curious shells and two fair pearls in two of them. But above all he abounded in things petrified, walnuts, eggs, in which the yolk rattled, a pear, a piece of beef with the bones in it, a whole hedgehog, a place on a wooden trencher turned into stone and very perfect, charcoal, a morsel of cork, yet retaining its levity, sponges, and a piece of taffety part rolled up, with innumerable more. In another cabinet, supported by twelve pillars of oriental agate, and railed about with crystal, he showed us several noble Italios of agate, especially a head of Tiberius, a woman in a bath with her dog, some rare cornelians, onyxes, crystals, etc., in one of which was a drop of water not congealed, but moving up and down when shaken. Above all, a diamond which had a very fair ruby growing in it. Diverse pieces of amber, wherein were several insects, in particular one cut like a heart that contained in it a salamander without the least defect, and many pieces of mosaic. The fabric of this cabinet was very ingenious, set thick with agates, turquoises and other precious stones, in the midst of which was an antique of a dog in stone scratching his ear, very rarely cut and comparable to the greatest curiosity I had ever seen of that kind for the accurateness of the work. The next chamber had a bedstead all inlaid with agates, crystals, cornelians, lazuli, etc., esteemed worth 16,000 crowns, but, for the most part, the bedsteads in Italy are of forged iron gilded, since it is impossible to keep the wooden ones from the simisses. Padua. 
from hence I returned to Padua when that town was so infested with soldiers that many houses were broken open in the night, some murders committed, and the nuns next our lodging disturbed, so as we were forced to be on our guard with pistols and other firearms to defend our doors, and indeed the students themselves take a barbarous liberty in the evenings when they go to their strumpets to stop all that pass by the house where any of their companions in folly are with them. This custom they called Kivalli, so as the streets are very dangerous when the evenings grow dark, nor is it easy to reform this intolerable usage where there are so many strangers of several nations. Using to drink my wine cooled with snow and ice as the manner here is, I was so afflicted with an angina and sore throat that it had almost cost me my life. After all the remedies Cavalier Veslingius, chief professor here, could apply, old Salvatico, that famous physician being called, made me be cupped and scarified in the back in four places, which began to give me breath and consequently life, for I was in the utmost danger. But, God being merciful to me, I was after a fortnight abroad again, when, changing my lodging, I went over against Pozzo Pinto, where I bought for winter provision three thousand weight of excellent grapes, and pressed my own wine, which proved incomparable liquor. This was on 10th of October. Soon after came to visit me from Venice Mr. Henry Howard, grandchild to the Earl of Arundel, Mr. Bramstone, son to the Lord Chief Justice, and Mr. Henshaw, with whom I went to another part of the city to lodge near St. Catherine's over against the Monastery of Nuns, where we hired the whole house and lived very nobly. Here I learned to play on the Theorb, taught by Signor Domenico Bassano, who had a daughter married to a doctor of laws that played and sung to nine several instruments, with that skill and address as few masters in Italy exceeded her. She likewise composed diverse excellent pieces. I had never seen any play on the Naples viol before. She presented me afterward with two recitativos of hers, both words and music. 31st October 1645, being my birthday, the nuns of St. Catherine's sent me flowers of silkwork. We were very studious all this winter till Christmas, when on Twelfth Day we invited all the English and Scots in town to a feast, which sunk our excellent wine considerably. Venice, 1645 to 46. In January, Signor Molino was chosen Doge of Venice, but the extreme snow that fell and the cold hindered my going to see the solemnity. So as I stirred not from Padua till Shrovetide, when all the world repair to Venice to see the folly and madness of the carnival, the women, men and persons of all conditions disguising themselves in antique dresses with extravagant music and a thousand gambols, traversing the streets from house to house, all places being then accessible and free to enter. Abroad they fling eggs filled with sweet water, but sometimes not over-sweet. They also have a barbarous custom of hunting bulls about the streets and piazzas, which is very dangerous, the passages being generally narrow. The youth of the several wards and parishes contend in other masteries and pastimes, so that it is impossible to recount the universal madness of this place during this time of licence. The great banks are set up for those who will play at Bassett. The comedians have liberty and the operas are open. Witty pasquils are thrown about and the mountebanks have their stages at every corner. The diversions which chiefly took me up were three noble operas, where were excellent voices of music, the most celebrated of which was the famous Anna Rencia, whom we invited to a fish dinner after four days in Lent, when they had given over at the theatre. Accompanied with an eunuch whom she brought with her, she entertained us with rare music, both of them singing to a harpsichord. In growing late, a gentleman at Venice came for her to show her the galleys now ready to sail for Condia. 
This entertainment produced a second, given us by the English consul of the merchants, inviting us to his house, where he had the Genoese, the most celebrated in Italy, who was one of the late opera band. This diversion held us so late at night, that conveying a gentlewoman who had supped with us to her gondola at the usual place of landing, we were shot at by two carbines from another gondola, in which were a noble Venetian and his courtesan, unwilling to be disturbed, which made us run in and fetch other weapons, not knowing what the matter was, till we were informed of the danger we might incur by pursuing it farther. Three days after this I took my leave of Venice and went to Padua to be present at the famous anatomy lecture, celebrated here with extraordinary apparatus lasting almost a whole month. During this time I saw a woman, a child and a man dissected with all the manual operations of the chirurgian on the human body. The one was performed by Cavalier Veslingius and Dr. Joe Athelstininus Leoninus, of whom I purchased those rare tables of veins and nerves and caused him to prepare a third of the lungs, liver and nervi sexti par with the gastric veins which I sent into England and afterward presented to the Royal Society, being the first of that kind that had been seen there, and for aught I know in the world, though afterward there were others. When the anatomy lectures, which were in the mornings, were ended, I went to see the cures done in the hospitals, and certainly as there are the greatest helps and the most skilful physicians, so there are the most miserable and deplorable objects to exercise upon. Nor is there any, I should think, so powerful an argument against the vice reigning in this licentious country as to be a spectator of the misery these poor creatures undergo. They are indeed very carefully attended and with extraordinary charity. 20th March 1646, I returned to Venice where I took leave of my friends. 22nd March 1646, I was invited to excellent English potted venison at Mr. Hobson's, a worthy merchant. 23rd March 1646. I took my leave of the Patriarch and the Prince of Württemberg and Monsieur Grotius, son of the learned Hugo, now going as commander to Candia, and in the afternoon received of van der Voort, my merchant, my bills of exchange of 300 ducats for my journey. He showed me his rare collection of Italian books, esteemed very curious and of good value. The next day I was conducted to the ghetto, where the Jews dwell together in a tribe or ward, where I was present at a marriage. The bride was clad in white, sitting in a lofty chair and covered with a white veil. Then two old rabbis joined them together, one of them holding a glass of wine in his hand, which in the midst of the ceremony, pretending to deliver to the woman, he let fall, the breaking whereof was to signify the frailty of our nature and that we must expect disasters and crosses amid all enjoyments. This done we had a fine banquet and were brought into the bride chamber where the bed was dressed up with flowers and the counterpane strewn in works. At this ceremony we saw diverse very beautiful Portuguese Jewesses, with whom we had some conversation. I went to the Spanish ambassador with Bonifacio, his confessor, and obtained his pass to serve me in the Spanish dominions, without which I was not to travel in this pompous form, Don Caspar de Tevez y Guzman, Marquez de la Fuente, Senor Alarino y Verrozzo, Comendador de Colos, in la Corden de San Iago, Alcade Mayor, Perpetue Escrivano, Mayor de la Ciudad de Sevilla, Gentilhombre de la Camara de SM Suas Milero Mayo, de su sosiejo, su ambasador extraordinario a los príncipes de Italia y Armalia y a esta serenísima república de Venecia, etc., habiendo de partir de esta ciudad, ciudad para la Milán de señor caballero Evelyn Inglis, con un criado, me han pedido pasaporte para los estados de su 
mio lehe mandato daro presente fermando di min mano e salado con esello de mis armas para el qual encargo a todos los menestros de ese montes quien le presentes a los de que no lo son suplico le dare pasa libremente sin permitir que se le haya vexación la alhuda anda es manda de las favor para continua su viaje Fieco a Venezia al 24 del mese de marzo del anno 1646, Madela Fuentes, etc. Having packed up my purchase of books, pictures, casts, treacle, etc., the making an extraordinary ceremony, whereof I had been curious to observe, for it is extremely pompous and worth seeing, I departed from Venice, accompanied with Mr. Waller, the celebrated poet, now newly gotten out of England, after the Parliament had extremely worried him for attempting to put in execution the commission of Array, and for which the rest of his colleagues were hanged by the rebels. The next day I took leave of my comrades at Padua, and receiving some directions from Dr. Salvatico as to the care of my health, I prepared for my journey towards Milan. End of section 21